Well, let's go, we'll go ahead and get started here with some announcements. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is incredibly exciting. It's, it's a little bit surreal here. I'm seeing, seeing people from various parts of my life here showing up all of a sudden uh, that I didn't expect. It's wonderful. We have uh, Katya is from Belarus. She's been part of our family and friends since, well, before she was born. I knew her dad when he was younger than Katya is. So, uh, she's here with us and, and other friends. It's Awesome to see everybody this morning. A um, couple announcements as we get going. The big announcement is we have been looking for ever, ever, <laughs> a year, more than a year, for someone to come in and kind of be administrator, program person, uh, point person on a lot of stuff that we need because. Administration, as far as the guilt, the skill sets in myself is below bad with that. And uh, we have needed someone to kind of run point, did mom, do things. And we have finally hired someone. Hey. It is it's incredible. Um, a young woman named Betty Wilton, who grew up on Skyline Drive on the street that surrounds here in Mount Sequoia, but she's she's been away living in Canada. She went to Bible College in Canada. She can tell her, we'll tell her whole story as she gets here. And uh, honestly, I've been trying not to get my hopes up too much um, because this is something that we've been looking for like forever. And, uh, and then I got this text that she and her husband, who is Canadian, um, they're moving down here. Uh, he couldn't cross the border. Oh, no. U.S. wouldn't let him in. Don't know why. I haven't got the full story, but I was like, it's this close. <laughs> so, but she's still going to come. She'll, she will be moving here Thursday. Wow. Hopefully she will be here next week with us, and we can do a formal introduction and everything with that. Uh, but we also probably will be sending out an uh, invitation to help welcome them. They are, they are moving down here with nothing. Um, they've been in Canada. They were planning on being for Can in Canada for long term. So um, anyway, they're, they're on their way down here, uh, or she's on her way down here, Betty is, and uh, we'll be introducing her more formally next week, hopefully, if not the week after with that. But pray, pray that her husband, Logan, is able to enter the States. Um, is she driving? Or are they uh, she is driving. I think they found someone to help drive her down with, with the few things that they do have. So they have a house rented, but like I said, she's... Now, especially, she's going to be arriving alone. So maybe need help unpacking, things like that. So watch communications uh, for things that are going on with that. Also, um, here's another big thing that we need to talk about is uh, we, we have been asked to meet outdoors at Vespers Point for the next five weeks because of some things that are going on here at Mount Sequoia. Personally, I, I don't mind that. Just, just personally, and especially with COVID numbers going up like they are in our area, 
being outdoors helps. However, I'm also realistic that it is hot. So, so we need to we need to as we do this come prepared for being outdoors in the heat with that, and even to the point of having a discussion if we want to meet earlier, if we want to if we want to for the next you know few weeks just go ahead and meet earlier. But we'll be having that discussion as we go. If you have input, if you have thoughts, if you have preferences on that, please let us know um, with that as we decide. Um, uh, you can, I mean, what do y'all think? I'll, I'll just take a quick poll. If we if we started at like 9.30, is that too early or is that good? good. It's good. It's good. good. I love outside. Would anybody hate that? Would anybody say, sorry, I'm... Durrell. Durrell. Well, <laughs> actually, Durrell may still be up from the yeah, night before <laughs> if we do 9.30. <laughs> yeah. Hey, in fact, if you said, how about we do it 5 o'clock in the evening, he'd be like... Yes. Um, I do want to be conscious, though. It, it does put a lot. That puts more on our worship team because they normally get here at eight thirty to prep. So moving that, we just have to be. Hey, we'll we'll deal with that. You guys pay us a lot of money. So, <laughs> so uh, I mean, go do the job. So it sounds like that's a, that's an, a that's a good option, at least for the next five weeks while we're meeting outside. So we will we'll we'll solid, we'll talk about that. Make sure there's not any unforeseen things that we don't know right now. But good, that's hey, great. Uh, John, just as, so, as you say, prepared, right? You know, part of it is because um, we did this last year, which we did quite a bit. Bring a lawn chair. Yeah. Because the sun, can, you know, they have pews set up out there, but they're not mobile, and so as the sun comes up, you find yourself sitting. You know, better to slide over into the shade with your with your yard chair. Absolutely, that's a good point. When we say we're meeting at Vespers, probably what that means is we're meeting on the lawn so that we can take advantage of the shade there. So camp chairs, camp blankets, things like that is unique. Um, any other announcements? Mm -mm. All right. Well, let's, let's take some time just to uh, center ourselves here. Um, as we enter in, we want to make sure that we clearly extend an invitation. This is a time to pay attention to what is going on in our lives. This is a time to pray something. This is a time to say something. It's okay to feel things with all the things going on in our world. Uh, Ellen and Sean aren't here. They, they were actually exposed, so they, um, they're not here, but Ellen's grandmother passed away last week. Um, they had a funeral last week, so we need to... Be mindful of lifting them up in this time. And uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, we'll, have, we'll have a little bit of silence here, and then I'm going to pray, and then we will pray the Lord's Prayer together. Um, and then we'll enter into our worship time. So just take a deep breath. Let it out. All those distractions, all those things that you have to get done, all those concerns that you have, they'll be there when you're, they'll be there. They're not going anywhere, just set them aside. Now's the time to listen. Now's the time to experience the presence of Jesus here with us. Abba, Father, we praise you for gathering us with all the options, all the other things we could be doing this morning. You've, you've gathered us here together. The complexity of all that is going on in our lives. The joys and the sorrows. The concerns, the fear, the challenges, the opportunities. We bring all those things here this morning. We confess that we're still in the process of becoming who you want us to be. There's still brokenness in our lives. There's still lack. There's still blindness. We don't get it right all the time. And that not only hurts us, it hurts others. 
And we confess that so that you can heal that. You can repair it. And God, we're also here because we cannot do this alone. We need each other. We need your Holy Spirit. None of us is designed to be autonomous. We don't work when we're by ourselves. So God, we ask that you would knit us together. God, we pray for those who are mourning, losing, have lost loved ones, have loved ones in crisis. God, we ask that you would bring healing and peace. And it's in the spirit of these prayers that we pray this together. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thanks, y'all. Hey, good morning again, everyone. Uh, my name is John Ray. For those of you watching on Facebook, listening on the podcast, welcome to Grace Church of Northwest Arkansas. All right, let's pretend for a minute. Okay. Everybody put your imagination hats on. Um, let's pretend that life comes with a really simple set of rules. Like I said, we're going to have to pretend here. Um, rules that allow you to clearly move through it based on how well you follow the rules. Do good things. What will happen? Good things. Good things will happen, right? Uh, stay in your lane. Everybody else stays in their lane. Try hard. Keep your nose clean. Don't deviate. And things will all work out. Nice and neat. Simple. Yes? Yeah. You with me? Anybody play that game before? Maybe uh, taught to play that game? Yeah. Maybe taught that that wasn't a game, but that's how life really worked. It's that if you did these things, play by the rule, stay in your lane, things would continually get better, right? Mm -hmm. Simple game. Common game. But is it true? Not so much. <laughs> but whatever else you want to say about Jesus, you have to admit he doesn't play games. Especially this one. I wish it was just a simple thought exercise, a what-if scenario. But in reality, this is many people's expectations. That if we figure out the formula, we can live pain-free. We can find the easy path. We can pick and choose our challenges. Some of us, through a bad combination of cultural conditioning and really bad theology, have come to see such a life not only as possible, but as some kind of right. Something that is owed to us for our faith, or our effort, or as some kind of inheritance. What we encounter in our text this week is something altogether different. What we see is that following Jesus means loving people, and that gets messy real quick. It's disruptive to our comfort. It dismantles our expectations of ease and continual progress to better and better things. But I want to encourage you that this isn't such a bad thing. This fact that it's a necessary thing. And we're not just told to do this, but we're shown how to do this by Jesus. This is one of the things of being an apprentice or a disciple of Jesus is that Jesus never tells us to go and do anything that Jesus hasn't gone and done. So that not only do we have instruction, but we have someone to follow. But that can be really sobering. That can be really challenging as we see what happens to Jesus. We've often said at Grace Church that the kingdom of God is people and things as they should be. Moving towards that necessarily involves a re Order, a reordering of our relationships with ourselves, others, and things. This is what following Jesus invites us to do. Well, let's see how this plays out in the text. So we've been working our way through Mark. We've had this image of that following Jesus is, is a way of being baptized. And we, when we started the series, we talked about how baptism is not so much a washing or a dunking, but it is a pickling. That the word baptizo in the Greek is the same word that recipes use for making pickles. That if you see this word in the Greek in your Bible, and you read an ancient Greek and Grecian recipe for making pickles, it's the same word. And that's why we have this on our communion table just during the study of Mark, is to remind ourselves that this is a process that involves transformation. That are calling to follow Jesus and our baptism by Jesus changes us. We're going to hear more about this later. 
uh, that I'm really excited about. But for now, we are in Mark 10. We're starting at verse 17, if you want to follow along. Now, as Jesus was starting out on his way, someone ran up to him, fell on his knees, and said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your mother and father. Quick aside here. Um, does anybody know what Jesus is quoting there? Ten Commandments, or at least half of them, correct? Five Commandments. Quick refresher, Ten Commandments are divided five and five. Five deal with how we relate to human beings, each other. Five relate with how we deal with God. Jesus calls the five here on, these are the way you relate, relate to one another. He doesn't even mention, it's funny, when he talks about eternal life, we often talk about your relationship with God. If someone said to you, if someone came to you right now and said, hey, Ashley, how, how do I get into the kingdom of God? What do I do, right? I think our, our impetus would be to talk about your relationship with God. You've got to get things right with God. Is that valid? Is that right? And Jesus doesn't do that. The guy comes, he's asking about eternal life, and Jesus says, well, let's talk about how you treat other people. So, so that alone is an astounding point. The other thing is he doesn't name five commandments, he names six. He adds one. We talk about this a lot at Grace, about how, how we, we have a Christological hermeneutic, right? The big seminary word, the Christological hermeneutic, which means we interpret Scripture through Jesus. That's how we look at it. And here, once again, we see Jesus interpreting Scripture, or better, reinterpreting Scripture. He adds to the Ten Commandments. No. Scandalous. <laughs> it is. It ought to be. It's scandalous. And what does he insert here? Did anybody catch? If you're looking at it, anybody catch the one that he inserts? Because he actually gives six things, not five things. Do not defraud. Do not defraud. Do not defraud. He adds to the Decalogue. With this, he, he inserts this one. And we talked a lot about it. We talked about why would Jesus insert this one thing? Um, here is my totally uninspired John Ray version, okay? This is not, do not take this as authoritative in any way, shape, or form. It's just my thought on it, all right? What was Jesus' biggest temptation? What, what did, when Satan comes and, and tempts Jesus, what does he start with every time? And it's something that the Pharisees ask him. It's something that even to the last on the cross, he's, he's asked this question. He's, he's tempted with this idea. If you're God. If you're God. The, the, in the wilderness, if you're the Son of God, do this. If you're the Son of God, do this. Pharisees, if you're the Son of God. On the cross, if he is the Son of God, then we come out. I believe that the, the single most significant temptation in Jesus' life was, hey, are you really who you say you are? Or are you a fraud? I think Jesus here is like, he, he it, it, in a way, it's a little bit of self-therapy for Jesus. <laughs> He's like, and don't defraud anybody. He's like, I am not a fraud. Don't defraud anybody. I'm not a fraud. Anyway, like I said, you got that one from previous one. That's on the side. Won't we'll find that in the commentary. It's none that I've ever read. Um, <laughs> The man said to him, Teacher, I have wholeheartedly obeyed all these laws since my, my youth. Jesus looked at him. He felt love for him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell whatever you have. Give the money to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. But at this statement, the rich man looked sad, went away sorrowful, for he was very rich. Or in the Greek, this says, He had many things. Because I think it's easy for us to go, well, that's not me. I'm not rich, right? How, I, very few of us, I think, really actively think of ourselves as rich. But if I said, hey, do you have a lot of stuff? Yeah, I got a lot of stuff. A lot of it I'd like to sell or give away. I'd like to be free of it. But I, I got a lot of stuff. 
So that, so just think about that here is this man had a lot of stuff and that helps us identify. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astonished at these words. Why were they astonished? Did they just not believe that God could do things? Why would they be astonished that a rich man, it was hard for a rich person to get into the kingdom of God? Anybody? They had so much stuff because they did good things. Exactly. Look, they were just as susceptible as us to think material blessing equates to God's blessing. That if you have a lot of stuff, you're being blessed by God. Mm-hmm. If you're poor, you're cursed by God. It's a common That's just how we tend to think religiously yeah. in these things. And the disciples were just as susceptible to it as we are. Um, but Jesus said to them, children, how hard it is to, even, to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Which, by the way, is impossible. Don't try it at home. I can just go ahead and tell you. Don't try to put your camel through a needle. <laughs> um, they were even more astonished and said to one another, then who can be saved? If these blessed people can't be saved, who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and replied, it is impossible for we are humans, but not for God. All things are possible for God. Peter began to speak to him, saying, look, look we've left everything to follow you, Jesus. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, there is no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake or for the sake of the gospel, who will not receive in this age a hundred times as much. Homes, brothers, sisters, mother, children, fields, all with persecutions. And in that age to come, eternal life. The many who will be last, who are first will be last, and the last will be first. They were going on their, and then we get this next little story, and it goes, they were on their way going up to Jerusalem. Jesus was going ahead of them, and they were amazed. But the two who followed him were afraid. He took the disciples, the twelve aside, and began to tell them what was going to happen to them. Look, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and experts of the law. They will condemn him to death and turn him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him severely, and kill him. Yet after three days, he will rise again. Interesting aside there. Right? We get this whole thing about entering the kingdom. Nothing's impossible with God. And then all of a sudden, Jesus is saying, but I'm going to go be crucified. They're going to physically do this thing to me. It seems like if everything was impossible with God, avoiding death, and especially avoiding crucifixion, would be high on the list of things that you would want God to make possible yeah. with that, right? So so last week we talked about the necessity of lowering oneself. This week, the inevitable consequences of that lowering, we see. Jesus sets no limit on how low he is willing to go. It's important to remind you here that crucifixion was, you, if you were a um, Roman citizen, you could not be crucified. It was against the law because it was so degrading. Crucifixion was saved for slaves, the worst of criminals. And if you were a Roman citizen, you, you couldn't be crucified. It was just too degrading. So when we talk about the lowering path, crucifixion is the bottom wrong. That's, that is the bottom, bottom, bottom. There is nothing below that with this. Um, so how has this been taught in the past? Well, as we talked about in the teaching team, the first part, this encounter with the, with, with the rich man, has been kind of taught, Alex used a word, I like this, as a moral ascendant, as a, as a story of moral ascendancy. The way that, hey, if we do good things, good things will happen. It actually used, is used as to confirm that idea rather than to come against it, which is crazy when you look at it. But it's like, hey, do these good things. Don't steal, don't lie, you know? And then, oh, and if that's not enough, hey, here's just one more thing you can do. Go and sell everything, right? It's kind of like, I, we want it so bad to fit into a formula. Just tell me what I got to do to be okay. What we don't say often is what we think after that, which is tell me what I got to do okay, 
to be okay and then leave me the heck alone. That's not what's happening. What we see instead is that Jesus is pointing us back to the reason there is a law in the first place. The reason there is a law is not for us to earn something, it's to teach us something. It's to call us to something. It's to invite us to something. It's to show us that when we even try to do good things, we often do them with the wrong motivation. Mm-hmm. That there is what he says. When he says, why do you call me good? There's no one good but God. He's literally saying, look, you can do all this stuff and still not be good. It's not the doing. It's not the earning. And that's why he says, it's not so much the thing about, hey, go sell all your stuff. It's the come follow me. That's the hard part. That's, and that's the telos. That's the end. That's the goal. That's what Jesus is trying to call all of us. Yes, don't murder, okay? I'm not going to have to go kill someone. Don't steal. Don't defraud. Don't do those things. But just know that even if you do all those things, that's not the goal. The goal is not to be good. The goal is to teach us something about God and ourselves so that we can follow. So that we will continually be oriented towards the person of Jesus Amen. with this. But then we get into this kind of weird little thing about Peter. I love Peter. We're going to study Peter in the fall a lot, his writings. Um, he's kind of saying, oh, oh, oh okay, if, it, if it's... It, if it's don't do those things and go and sell all your stuff, look at me. Hey, over here. Look at me. We left everything. I, I, wife is back home, sold the boat. I'm after you, right? <laughs> and Jesus is up here. Come on, man. Like, like, yeah, you did all that. And let me tell you something. You're going to get more. For everything you gave up, you're going to get more. And you're going to get it now. And you're going to get all the problems that come with it. And what we see here is Jesus, while Jesus rarely talks explicitly about the church, he talks a lot about the church in different ways. And what he is talking about here is the inheritance or this realignment of our relationships that all of us get when we're part of the church. Is we give each other. Like I talked about it last week. I, I get the cornets cool, right? It's a really cool thing. Is, 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 is I, I get to use it. And then Alex reminds me, and you also get to come help clean it. Like you get you get all the problems that go along with cool ownership with that. And that's a very small thing, but it, it illustrates, I, I love it because it's a practical illustration of I think what happens when when we give up, and I don't mean give up like we necessarily reject, but when we make our priority with God, our relationship with God, the primary relationship, Jesus talks in much more stark terms in different places about, you know, if you don't love me more than your mother, if you don't love me more than your father, if you don't love me more than your brothers and sisters. Um, we are called to do that. We are called to prioritize and honor our relationship with God over every other human relationship. When we do that, we enter into this community of the church in a way that is meant to be a community that shares radically. That all of a sudden, instead of um, one biological sister two biological, or two half-sisters, three half-brothers, I have y'all. I got a whole bunch of brothers and sisters now. And you got me. I, I'm your brother. I'm not, I'm not some superstar guy up here who knows all this stuff because I've got the microphone and the iPad and the thing. No, I am one of the, we, we are all in this together. We are learning together. We're growing together. We're sharing together. And at times, that's awesome. And at times, that is devastating when we have to share in the suffering and the tragedy going through. But that is necessary 
it's not only necessary for the person who suffers, as, as you all know our story, Jane and I's story, with, with what we've lost, but it's also, I, I need, we need you, but I also need to be needed. Like, each of us needs to enter into the suffering of other people so that we ourselves can grow with them. And so our inheritance is each other in this life, but then on top of that, there is an eternal life that comes to promise where everything that we long for will ultimately be worked out. So we're not left with just this, as precious as that is, we also see that it has a, it's working towards something else altogether again. Is that it's working towards this end thing of ultimate restoration with that. Um, and no, we're not, we're not going to do this by earning. We talk about it a lot. The grace here, grace is not opposed to effort, it's opposed to earning, right? We obey not because of what we hope to earn. We obey because of what we've already received and what it is necessary to do in us and through us. And in that process, and I love this part, this scripture is so clear here that, that the man comes, falls on his knees, I imagine he had his head down in a sign of respect. And, and I, I can imagine Jesus reaching down and lifting, lifting the man's head up and looking at him. It said Jesus saw him. We see this again. He saw the woman. He saw the person. He saw the leper. He saw him. Y'all, no, Jesus sees us. He sees you. He sees you. You're not a thing. You're not an abstraction. You're not an idea. You're not a problem to be solved. He sees you as you are. And that is terrifying. It's, 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 what, we, it's what we all ultimately long for, what we want, but at the same time, it's terrifying to be seen, right? Uh -huh. Not just for introverts. <laughs> oh. but, but for all of us at times... We, we, want to, we want people to see part of us. We talked about this in the teaching team, Laura and, and Tim especially. We talked about how there are parts of our story that we're real quick to share. Okay? I'm sorry, it's getting personal here on this holiday weekend. But <laughs> we're getting a little personal here. That's okay. We all have a story that we like to tell people. And man, that story may seem real intimate. It may seem real revealing. Chances are it's only part of the story. They're, they're a part of our struggles, part of our personalities, part of our stories that we are quick to share with other people in order, in a way, to divert the gaze rather than to invite the gaze. Because we want people to see something we don't want him to see it all. Jesus sees it all. And that's terrifying. But what it also does is it forces us to see it. Because we become so used to the story we tell other people, we start to believe it ourselves. And we start to, we start to lose the potential or the ability to really see ourselves. And Jesus sees us. That's taken away. Because he sees it all, and we have to see it all. And so when we look at that and we go, well, how is this possible? I don't necessarily even want that. I mean, I do, but I don't. I, I, yes, please, no, don't. I mean, that there, right there, I've been searching a long time for how do I relate to God. I just said it. Yes, please, no, oh, don't. <laughs> that is... That is my discipleship. That's John Ray's relationship with God right there. I, I, am I the only one? No. Everybody's just laughing at me like, oh, of course. Because we God. really. Am I the only one that that's true for? Mm -hmm. um, but that's why this promise comes in. That for you, yeah, it's, it's impossible. You can't do that. You can't do that just out of your own willpower or your own effort. You're, gonna, you're only going to be able to go so far. And then you're going to chicken out. He knows that guy. knows that about us. He says, but for you, it's impossible for me. Man, I can do it. I got you. 
Follow me. Yeah, do these things because I teach you. But just know that you're not going to earn me anything. All it's going to do is teach you. Learn the lesson. Follow me. And Jesus is always trying to get us to see things differently, ourselves differently. When we see things, we're able to reorient our expectations, our affections, our allegiances, our affiliations, even our family. We inherit this family, the church. We are their inheritance. Um, I love when he says, you know, I'm going to give you all these things because <laughs> this is definitely not a proof text for prosperity theology, although it has been used in prosperity theology. They just conveniently leave out all the thing and the persecutions that come with it. I mean, this is literally a coffee mug verse, right? I will give you all these things a hundred times, a hundredfold. Lands and fields and houses and brothers and sisters. Period. Except there's not a period there. It says, and the persecutions that come with them. Um, with that. It, but, but here is something true I will tell you. God can never be in our debt. There is nothing you will ever give up. There is nothing you will ever do. And God will all of a sudden go, oh, I owe Sheree. Did you see what she just did? Oh my gosh. I've only done this much for Sheree and now she's done this much for me. Like, and I'm not picking on Sheree. I'm like, all of us, right? Like, the minute we start to think, but God, look at all I've given up for you. Don't you know what it's cost me? To follow you? Yes. God knows. But we have to consider everything. And we consider even the breath that we breathe. The ability to give the things away as a gift from God. We'll never be in God's death. There's no way that that's going to happen. I think the universe would actually cease to exist. Just because of love or something. Like that happen. Um, here's the other thing. It's true about all this. All relationships cause pain. All relationships cause pain. I hurt you. I will hurt you. I have hurt people in here. I have been hurt. There is no way to walk through this existence without pain. Pain happens. And that's what I love about Christianity. That's what I love about the Bible. That's what I love about the Word. It is so hyper-realistic in, in both the diagnosis of the problem and the prescription of the cure. We cause each other pain. It happens. Parents cause their children pain. Children cause their parents pain. Friends cause your friends pain. Husbands cause your wives pain. Wives cause your husbands pain. On and on and on. Groups cause other groups pain. It happens. What the Bible does is it leads us through this process, though, of recognition, repentance. That's why one of the basic elemental pro proclamations of the gospel is repent. Recognize that term. Recognize that you... You've been hurt. Recognize that you hurt. Repent. The kingdom of God is here. What does that mean? It's restoration. The kingdom of God is restoration. And so what we see is not that so much that we are given to, to kind of bring this to a close and if the worship team wants to come up. Not so much that we're given this imaginary formula, do this, stay in your lane, keep your nose clean, everything will work out, you'll all be okay. That's not Christianity. That is not Christianity. Christianity, no. Hey, you know what? Don't do bad things to people. When you do bad things to people, and bad things are done to you, here's the healing. Here's the restoration. That nothing is broken that cannot be fixed. Nothing that has been transgressed cannot be addressed. There is nothing beyond it. It may take our life. It may take eternity to see. But there is nothing that is beyond redemption with that. Thank God. And what could possibly allow us to let these things go? It is the knowledge that we are already free. It's the knowledge that Jesus sees us and accepts us. 
That thing about being seen by Jesus is that Jesus looks at us and sees us and he doesn't go, ugh. <laughs> That's not the response. He doesn't look at us and go, oh, I see you, Amy. Now let me tell you, you need to do this, this, and this, and this. And I'll come back and I'll check on you later and see if you've done all that stuff. It's not that at all. No, he sees us and he loves us. Not only loves us, but likes us. Wants to be with us, gives himself to us. He proves this by the cross. That's, that's what the, the, the cross proves the depth of God's love for us. So you can you can bring to me the worst pain, the worst suffering, the worst persecution, and I'll take it. And I won't retaliate. I won't, I won't fight back. I won't curse you. I won't abandon you. I won't leave you. I will hang here literally for you. Man, you want to talk about freedom? You want to talk about a freedom worth celebrating? A freedom worth pulling out all the stops for? That's the freedom. The freedom that God sees us. That God loves us. That God was willing to go to the cross to prove that. He did it. That there's nothing left. There's nothing left to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing. It's, it's done. With that. May we walk in that knowledge, church, friends, family. May we walk in that knowledge. Thanks for being here this morning. Um, we're going to have a time of worship, have a time of communion. Our communion table is welcome to all. Jesus says, come eat. You don't have to prove it. You don't have to earn anything. You don't even have to confess anything. Just come. Sit at the table. Everybody gets a place. Also, this is a time where we give our offering. There's an offering box up there. You can give online, but we do that as part of our worship, as part of recognition. Hey, everybody here has a need. Everybody here has something to give. So we do that. It's also a time to reflect. If there is something that has been said to you or you have heard, I may have said it, or the Holy Spirit may have said it, or your neighbor may have said it. Please write it down. Do something with it. Don't, don't just let it escape this time. Because it's so easy. As soon as we walk out the door, we know what's going to happen, right? Oh, you're gonna, all those things are going to come back in that we, we set aside when we prayed this morning. What do I got to do? Where do I got to be? Oh, I got to do this. I got to do that. And what is said now will quickly Spirit, so commit now. Write that thing down. Test it out. Um, and thanks for being here. Brought me to his banquet.
Wow. Amen. That's it. <laughs> Leah wrote our benediction today, so Yay. we're excited. First Church, I pray these things over you, that you go today and feel safe to run to the Lord, the good teacher, and boldly speak and ask questions, that you feel God look at you in loving response, and for the times you come away unsatisfied, may God give you peace as you consider the words of the Spirit. May your hearts openly receive what God will make possible through you. And may God show you the blessings they have for you and give you hope in persecutions. My family in Christ, go in peace. Amen. Amen.